doors. They open, close, welcome, expose, exclude, embrace the unknown. Verse after verse in every scripture of the Bible, a door awaits, a journey of faith is disclosed. A door closed tight, the forbidden fruit. A door afloat in the floods of chaos, salvation's boat. A door marked with blood, a tale of liberation in a crimson flood. A door sacred, holiness guarded, incense rising, only a few may enter to take him in. A door sealed, a somber scene, yet resurrection whispered, the future seen. A door wide open, full of hope, grace triumphant in resurrection scope. The Bible unfolds doors of destiny and grace, each chapter God's sacred space. Well, good morning, Anthem. It's so good to see everybody here today, and I'm glad that you're joining us for week four of our series called Doors of the Bible. I'm excited about what God has led me to share with us here today. Before we do that, today is also Big Give Sunday around our church, an opportunity for us to give together specifically to our vision and for me to celebrate with us so many things that God did with us and through us during the unfinished season. And we have a lot to celebrate because God has done so much in our midst, moving on the hearts of people to join us in this vision that God has given to us as we move into the year to come and say, God, how can you use us to impact a city and impact a world for the message of Jesus Christ. So I have four celebrations I wanna share with us here today and a couple takeaways and next steps related to that. And then I'd like to pray and jump into our message uh, here this morning. The first uh, celebration that we have today is related to so many people making brand new, first time commitments to the unfinished vision around our church. In fact, around Anthem, during this last year, we had 53 households make brand new commitments. And so that represents people beyond households, because many households uh, have a number of people in them. So that represents 131 adults, students, and kids around our church made brand new commitments to our unfinished vision, and that means a lot of you were part of that, and I just wanna say thank you for stepping out in faith and jumping in with us in the season and the vision that God is gonna do in and through us as a church. The second group of people around our church were people that are committed to finishing strong. They may have been here a year ago. You may have been here a year ago and made a decision to finish strong as we move into uh, the year that is to come, and so as a church, we had so many people committing to finishing strong, including 90 households representing 275 adults, students, and kids. So grateful for every single person. <laughs> part of that, we need everybody, and you are part of that. Even if the last year's been harder financially or you've got some roadblocks, you deciding to finish strong is an act of faith, and we're so grateful for you doing that. And the last group is in a celebration related to what God's done through us as the people is so many people around Anthem made a commitment to increase their commitments, meaning they were here a year ago, prayed, sought God, made a commitment, and then as we came around this year to unfinish, decided to raise their commitment, maybe just a raising of their faith, or maybe God's provided extra resources, or as I know is the case for so many around our church, just saw the great need we have to expand our building to make more space for kids and said, we wanna be part of that and helping with that. And so I'm excited to celebrate with us here today that 44 households committed to increase their commitments, representing 132 adults, students, and kids. So let's put our hands together and thank God for that. That means that over 500 people are included in some way in the commitments during this season. I think it's something like 530 people represented by these decisions across our church. And so that means our church has really rallied to this season and this vision. And so we're so grateful for every single person uh, and their involvement in it. And so the fourth celebration I have is related to our 
grand total where we are with our unfinished season and, and the amount that we have related to our goal. And so let me give a little context so that I can get us to all be on the same page as we think about where we are. Before we started Unfinished a year ago, which was a, Unfinished is a two-year vision, if you're new around our church, two-year vision to reach our community, includes everything we're doing ministry-wise, the kids, students, adults, how we're discipling people, how we're outreaching to our community, missions we're doing around the world, building houses in Mexico, caring for missionaries in Cambodia and all these different places around the world, stewarding our facility, taking care of our staff, all the things that we do is a two-year vision, including all of that, including our facility projects that we're pursuing as a church, putting in lighting on our property, which has been an incredible blessing already at evenings. If you've been up here at an evening to see all the light that's on the property, our playground that's in the middle of construction right now that has the hope to uh, be opened the first week of June uh, in just a little while as they uh, ramp up and they build a little faster here in the weeks to come. Uh, that's our goal, and to add on to our facility because of our need with kids. So going into a year ago, our average normal annual giving was a million and a half a year, meaning the people of Anthem would give on an ongoing basis a million and a half dollars every single year. So as we thought about our two-year vision, thought, thought about our needs, our goals, and what God was uh, calling us to, we knew we had a lot, have a lot of growth in that. And thank God, last year, a year ago this time, we ended our our unfinished season to begin with at a four and a half million dollar commitments and expected gifts. And we were just thanking God that that's where we were financially so that we could move into the season that is ahead. And so we had to change some of our projects. We had to raise our goal in somewhat of an aggressive standpoint to move into the future. And so I'm excited to announce today our new total of commitments and expected gifts is now five million $8,291, which is incredible, meaning we grew over $500,000 just in this last year because of the commitments of the people of Anthem stepping in the gap with us. So a couple of things to say related to all of this. First of all, we knew that our $6.2 million goal and need was aggressive. For a size, for our size church, in light of what our normal giving is to go from one and a half to six over a two-year period, it was a pretty aggressive big, but that's what the need is to be able to add on to our building. We don't have fluff in there. We have literally thought through where the needs are, what the expenses are, and so we knew that that was a, an aggressive goal for us to pursue, and truth be told, we haven't met that goal yet. We're not there. We're at five million, and we're thanking God for that, but we're not at 6.2 million at this moment. But I have to say, even though we're short of our goal and where we need to be in the end, I think it's incredible to see the response of the people of Anthem to grow. $500,000 in just a year two conversation is an incredible growth around our church. And people have dug deep to give and to make commitments and join with us in our vision. So we might come into that and we have all kinds of motions as a church and as leaders. Okay, what do we do related to that? You might feel like we're, we're failing. We're actually doing incredible. It's just that our need to add on to the building is an expensive addition for us to do but we know that we need to do it as we move into the days to come. So in some sense, we're short of our goal. In another sense, we're grateful for where we are. God is providing and moving through the hearts of people, and we believe that he's been speaking to everybody here. And third thought I have related to that is, you know, we call the season unfinished because we're saying God's completing a work in all inside of all of us to complete the work and make us into the people he wants us to be. And it just seems so appropriate that we're unfinished with our goal, right? I mean, that's our, our theme and that's where God's left us. So we're saying, God, you have more to do. You're gonna have to fill in the gaps. You're gonna have to provide in the ways that you see fit and we're trusting you to do exactly that. So what's next related to that? Well, our leadership, hey, we've talked We've texted, we've had conversations, we've prayed, we've thought about it in light of where we are and where we need to be. And we believe that we have crossed the threshold that we needed to in order to move ahead with all parts of our unfinished vision. 
So here's my exciting announcement for today. Though we're still trusting God, we're still waiting on him to provide some things. I'm excited to announce that we plan to begin construction of the Kids Wing edition this fall. We're going to break ground, and we're going to do it, and we're going to move forward together and add on the space. Isn't that exciting? So we thank God for that. And so we're walking by faith and not by sight, and here's the issue. It's going to take us about 10 months to complete the construction once we begin it. And as a leadership, we just realized we don't have years to wait in light of the fact we're already turning kids away on a number of Sundays on a regular basis. In fact, I just looked at one of our Sundays just a week or two ago, maybe leading into uh, spring break. We had 200 children here on one Sunday. That's becoming more the norm. And so to think we're going to wait uh, 18 months, even if we follow the schedule, which is the reality, that's going to be a while to wait. We're going to have some issues with space over 18 months, but we can't wait three, four years to do it. We really have to move forward because that's where our needs are. And so like you would at your house, if you had uh, some needs, sometimes you have to step forward and deal with it. By God's grace, we don't have any debt. We're not walking into the season with any debt. We're trusting God to provide the rest of the funds over the next year or maybe over the next years as we deal with it. But we just believe we have to move forward. We cannot wait to do what's in front of us. So we are moving forward. We're acting in faith. We're going to do what we believe God has led us to do. And we still believe it puts us in a good conservative financial position as we move into the future together, okay? So that's my big announcement for today. And so today we're calling Big Give Sunday. And if you'd like to give today towards the season to help us get started with our projects, as we say every week, you can go to weareanthem.church slash give, or you can take the envelope that's in the seat in front of you, and you can begin to do that. And I want to speak to the three different groups of people that are here, uh, which represents a, a large percentage of our church. If you made a brand new commitment, well, today's the day officially that our commitments, giving towards our commitments begins. I know many people have already been giving on their commitments, and thank God, thank Thank you for doing that. We're grateful for that. But today officially is the starting place. So if you made a brand new commitment, today's the day and the weeks to come to begin giving towards that commitment so we can move forward. And one of the ways that I would suggest doing that is if you had a certain amount that God led you to give, maybe that's a monthly amount or twice a month or whatever it might be, to set that up on an ongoing basis online. If you go to weareanthem.church slash give, it's going to give you an option to do a one-time gift or to set up a recurring gift. And if you have a certain amount you want, you're planning to give monthly, I would encourage you to do that. It'll get you moving in the right direction and help us to do that. For others of you that are finishing strong, today's a great day to catch up. If you're a little behind, today's a great day to catch up uh, or to just stay strong and keep going with where you're at and to finish strong. And you can give with us today and every single week around our church towards unfinished. And last of all, to so those who made increasing commitments, we are so grateful for you. We so need needed people to step forward and increase their commitments, and so many of you did that. We're grateful for you. Today's a great day for you maybe to accelerate your giving if you're able to. Maybe you can give a little bit more in this half of the year, maybe then the next half of the year, just to help us to get in a good, strong financial position to move forward with what God has led us to do to our building, uh, but that today is a great day to give. So grateful for where we're at. We're moving forward into the future. We're trusting God to fill in the rest of the needs as we move forward. We're endeavoring to be conservative financially, but we know that the need is here. It's upon us, and we can't delay it any longer. And so we're going to move forward this fall with adding on to our kids wing and doing all the other ministry, missions, outreach that God has called us to during the unfinished season. So let's bow our heads. Let's pray together as a church family that God will will provide and lead us forward, and then I'm gonna jump into the message here today. Lord God, thank you for who you are. Thank you that you're a provider and you're providing for your church. And Lord God, we know that the steps that are ahead of us, we're, we're taking some bold steps into the future. We're believing you and trusting you uh, for what's next, and we're excited. We're excited that we have 200 kids uh, on, on many weeks around here, and we don't wanna turn any kids away as we've had to on some occasion, and we want to do less and less of that. And so, Lord God, we pray that you would provide the funds needed. But more than that, we're praying that you would 
you would give us the boldness and the sense of purpose to reach our city for Christ. That's what we want more than anything. We want to see men and women and families and kids and students find the hope that's found in Jesus Christ. We want to see our Jesus' hope wall filled with light bulbs to the point where we have to come up with a next solution to continue to celebrate the life change that's happening. And you're doing that, and we believe you're going to do it more and more in the future. So we pray that you get us ready spiritually and practically for what's yet to come. We know you'll do it. Pray all this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen. Doors of the Bible. So the most important message in the world is found in the Bible. If you're a Christian, you know that to be true. It's what we call the gospel. And the gospel simply is the good news of Jesus Christ, his life, his death, his resurrection, and his promise to one day come again. And to talk about the gospel and talk about the good news, one of the ways we can do it is through the prism of these doors in the Bible, significant doors like passageways, moments, doors that are closed and doors that are open that begin to help us to better understand who is Jesus, what did he come to do, what did he come to fix, and what is he coming to bring about on behalf of Jesus. Humanity, And so, so far, we've gone through a couple doors together. It's been a powerful journey so far, which, by the way, is going to culminate on Easter as we talk about the most important doors that are still ahead of us. We start with the garden door. We talked about Adam and Eve in the garden, walking and talking with God in perfect communion, perfect fellowship. But Adam and Eve chose to sin and rebel and walk away from that perfect fellowship with God. And they ate of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And their eyes were opened in all the wrong ways. It wasn't a helpful thing to their condition. And God had to change the dynamics of how things were working. They could no longer live forever in the poor, difficult state they were in. He had to begin to change things and write a new chapter to the human story. And so he excluded them from this place called Eden, which means delight. It was the place of God's delight where everything was as it was supposed to be. And God shut the door to Eden and humans were no longer on the place that they were supposed to be any longer. They were shut out looking in. And the Bible says they, they moved east. We think, well, they just moved east. Well, moving east is a symbol for how humans move further and further away from God. The people in the east, like the Babylon later to come, the the wickedness is in the east, and so they moved east away from God, away from the garden. And the week after that, we talked about the ark door, and Pastor Andrew did such a great job of just communicating how the ark is a symbol of salvation. It's a reality that God is just. He's he's kind, but he's also just. He he won't be taken advantage of, and as things should be, they are. And so he was bringing punishment onto a world that was spiraling down further and further away from God into destruction. And he said, I can't can't let this keep going. This is not right. People are killing others. People are harming others. There has to be an end to this. And he decides to bring about a new beginning, not just a punishment, but a new beginning of salvation for humanity. He says, I'm going to speak to a man to build an ark I'm going to tell him to put a door in the side of the ark because this door is going to be a symbol for all that I'm going to do for all the rest of human history. We talked about the fact that those who went through the door into the ark, the animals, the family, Noah, his wife, his sons, as they went into the door, they were saved and God protected them from the coming judgment, just like God intends to do for all of humanity. When we come through the door who is Jesus Christ into salvation, God saves us from all the calamity that is yet to come in this world. Thank God for that. The ark becomes the symbol of salvation. And then last week, Jimmy did such a great job of talking about um, the Passover door, where the people in Egypt were unwilling to let the firstborn of God, Israel himself, the firstborn go out and to be with God in fellowship. They restricted the firstborn. So God brought about a plague on Egypt's firstborn and said, if you're not going to let my firstborn go, then, then I'm going to have to bring justice to your firstborn. It's a very difficult story in so many ways. But God said, but there is a way out from the coming judgment as the angel of death is going to pass over and strike the lives of the firstborn. It's talked about in Exodus. You take the blood of a lamb and you go to the doorpost of your house 
and you'll put the blood of the lamb over your house. Then when the angel of death comes to bring destruction, it will see the blood of the lamb on the doorposts of your home and it will pass over your house and not bring destruction. This great picture of what Jesus intends to do, the lamb of God slain for the salvation of the world. And then when we come into a relation with God, we put the blood of Christ by accepting his death for us on our hearts. And then when God comes to see if we're in him or not, he passes over us and doesn't bring judgment into our life, but instead brings salvation to us. These great pictures in the Bible. The temple door I want to talk about, the door I want to talk about today is the temple door. It's just a powerful door in the Old Testament. I'm going to do my best to bring us up to speed since we don't live around temples and we don't understand all that's happened in the Old Testament. Nearly 500 years after Moses, Moses is the one that goes into Egypt, comes out, God speaks to him, gives him a mission. He leads the people of Israel out of bondage and slavery. He gets the Ten Commandments. He helps people to know how to worship God. Nearly 500 years after Moses and almost 1,000 years before the birth of Christ, King Solomon, with the help of his dad, David, who prepares in advance, builds the temple in Jerusalem, a place for people to worship their God. This is an image, a picture uh, uh, from an archaeology group that's endeavored to show what the temple might have looked like. And it, sometimes it's hard to know exactly each part and how it would work, but this is an image that shows the, uh, the altar where sacrifice would be made, the basin where priests would be cleansed before they went closer and closer towards God. And then you have these doors at the front. There's a, a barrier where most people couldn't go, and in fact, only some priests on some rotation could go past the first doors into that first room of the temple. We call it the holy place. It's a place where they would pray and offer incense, and they would seek God. they come before God, and all in preparation to stand before what was called the Holy of Holies, which is the last section of the temple that they would go just on some occasion to stand before God in the closest place they could possibly be to the presence of God. On the inside, though it doesn't show it well in this picture, there was what we'll call today a door into the Holy of Holies, but it was really more like a giant curtain, a, a veil that stood there. The size of that veil was incredibly large. It protected the Ark of the Covenant was there, at least when Solomon built. The, the Ten Commandments would have laid there. It's the place of God's special presence, though God can't be contained by a building. He can't be boxed in by a structure. God is everywhere at all times. He chose to bring his special presence to God, the closest place where humans could, in a sense, touch heaven or touch God and have a relationship with him. Standing before it was this veil, immense, 60 feet by 30 feet is our best estimate of the size of this veil. How many of you have curtains on any windows in your home? Any curtains? 60 feet by 30 feet is a big set of curtains. This is what stood between them. It was never just standing open. It was always closed before this holy of holies where people weren't allowed to come and not only was it a large, 60 feet by 30 feet, our best understanding, but it was thick, at least according to Jewish tradition, though the Bible doesn't say what the thickness is, and it may have changed from time to time, but the thickness was something approaching the width of a man's hand. So we're going to say something like four inches thick. This is a big curtain. Can you imagine the weight of a curtain of that size? 60 feet by 30 feet, four inches thick. This is an incredibly heavy curtain, in fact, Though it may be some hyperbole, Jewish tradition said that it would have taken 300 priests to put it into position and get it into the right place to stand there and hang there or to be moved, an immense veil between man and God. What's interesting and is critically important to what we're going to talk about today is in that place, the Holy of Holies, the closest a human could possibly be to God by God's own design and plan is that only the high priest could enter. So if you draw out from the temple, you have a certain distance where Gentiles, which probably the majority of the people here were Gentiles, meaning we're not Jewish by birth. We're Gentiles. Gentiles could only get so close to even the temple grounds. There's a distance, a separation. And then beyond that, women could only get so close 
to the Holy of Holies. And then beyond that, men could only get so close to the Holy of Holies. And then beyond that, priests who could get closer than anyone else could only get so close to the Holy of Holies. And then there's only one person who could go into the Holy of Holies, and that was the high priest, who in a sense stood as a representative of all of the people before God. He could go and stand in the Holy of Holies, one person, but only one day each year on a date called the Day of Atonement or Yom Kippur. It's the day where the high priest would go in, not just strolling in, not just coming in like like it was no big deal, but with great sincerity and carefulness would go into the Holy Holies with the blood of a lamb and would sprinkle it on the Ark of the Covenant saying before God, we know we've sinned. We know we're not worthy to be before you. We know that our lives, we've been in rebellion against you, and so would you just take the blood of the Lamb as an offering for the forgiveness of sins to cover over the sins that we've committed in our lives? And that high priest, at least it's said on some occasion, they would, they would tie a rope around his foot on the way in. because They thought, if he goes in in an unworthy manner, if he goes in in a way not the way God prescribed, if he doesn't go and do, or if he goes in on a day he's not supposed to go in, that he might just be struck dead before God that day. That God's not gonna accept an unworthy approach to him. And so they say, but we can't go in after him because then God might be angry with us as well. And so let's just tie a rope. It's pretty smart, actually. Just tie a rope around his ankle and we'll just pull him out if we have to. One man on one day, and that man wasn't supposed to linger. He wasn't supposed to spend a lot of time there. You just go in, you do what you're supposed to do, and you go out. So we read all this, and we think about, oh, this is sort of complicated. Aren't you, by the way, aren't you glad that it's not that complicated to have a relation with God any longer? In some sense, this is a positive image. It's a, a picture of how the fact that God wants mankind to come closer to himself. He actually made a way for us to approach him. It, it says something about God and his orientation towards humanity, that he didn't want them just to never interact with him. He actually wanted to draw them closer to himself, but there's a proper way to do it before a holy God. It's, so it's a picture of God wanting us, but knowing that there has to be a certain way that we would approach for it to be accepted. So that's the good news. God wanted us to be able to approach in some way. But the bad news, it also shows the distance between God and man. In fact, it shows that our sins as people made us unfit to stand before a holy God. It wasn't God just erecting all these casual barriers. It was that our sins made us unfit we were not holy to stand before a holy God, to stand in the presence of the perfect one who created all things, who made all things. We were not, we were not ready to experience what God wanted to do. And it says that the longing inside of man for intimacy with God was not met. And that's what's so amazing and what happens at the crucifixion of Jesus, because something really important happens at the crucifixion of Jesus Christ that's recorded in the book of Matthew. As Jesus was on the cross and was giving up his spirit, Matthew 27, verse 50 to 51, records, and when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, I mean, he had cried out in several times. We recorded all through the Gospels these conversations. But when he had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit and at that moment, the curtain, the veil, the door of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Think of all the things that happens at the crucifixion of Jesus, all the pain, all the weeping, all the moments. It says when he went to die, great earthquake happens. Only this curtain that's hanging there is way too thick to be damaged by an earthquake. This isn't a moment where it was just like the earth shook so much that some, some structural things happened to the building. It's, it's so thick, it would have taken something supernatural to tear it. You try to take something four inches thick and, and try to like tear it in half, you're just not gonna be able to do that, at least not under human or normal power. 
God was doing something through the crucifixion of Jesus. It says, actually, an earthquake happened. Some tomb split open. Some dead people walked out of it. It's kind of like a, it's a little like a horror movie in the moment. It's like, like, I don't know exactly what's happening, but Jesus was displaying and talking about what he was accomplishing. He was shaking things and changing them. And that he was bringing about the power and the possibility of resurrection, that though we die, we might live again. And he was going to rise from the dead. So in his crucifixion, the beginning of that happened. And in the midst of that, he took that curtain that separated man from God, and he tore it into himself. It's almost like when Jesus said, it's finished. My work is finished. He was thinking of all these things that he was finishing on behalf of humanity. So we go into the garden. We say the door is shut. We're on the outside looking in, and we begin to move east. We're moving away from God. Things are getting worse and worse, and yet God knows he's going to begin to orchestrate a different chapter to our story. And here he is giving his own blood giving his own body upon a cross because he knows what he's about to do is to rip open that door that was shut in the garden once and for all. To say, that's no longer gonna be true between me and humanity. I'm opening that door back up again. I'm tearing it in two so that they could enter in. So we say, well, this is a cosmic change to everything that's happened for humanity. Say, once... Only the high priest could stand in God's presence. But now, because the veil is torn in two, access to God is made possible for all who believe. It's a miracle. The crucifixion, it cost him everything. But he said, yeah, once upon a time, you were unfit to stand before a holy God. But I'm changing all of that. All this old barriers from Gentile to woman, to man, to priest, to high priest, it's wiped away. That those old barriers that kept you from a distance because you were unfit to stand before a holy God, now access has been granted to all who would believe because I'm making all things as they were supposed to be from the very beginning. What I love about the picture is I, I like to picture it not so much as Jesus coming up to a curtain and just kind of pulling it back nicely and letting some people in. I, I like to think of it like strong Jesus standing with a 60-foot by 40-foot curtain and ripping it in two, tearing down the veil before us. I like to think of it like the Jesus, maybe you know the story, where Jesus goes into the temple courts and he sees things not as they're supposed to be. People are being taken advantage of, and he goes in with a whip and he's throwing tables over in strength. That's the image I like to think of this door, the temple door. He says, I know it was that way, and it was, it was for a time, but now I'm taking all of that apart. We no longer will need a temple. We'll no longer need a curtain. We'll no longer need a building. We'll no longer need distance, but you can come close to be in connection with me. What great news is that? This is the gospel of Jesus Christ, that you don't, first of all, have to worship at a building Second of all, you don't have to stand at a distance. Third of all, you don't have to think it's never going to get better. But Jesus has changed it forever and ever on our behalf. So Levi and I, um, last year we went to Washington, D.C. How many of you have ever been to Washington, D.C. at some point in your life? Uh, Washington, D.C. has an incredible place filled of so much history and uh, incredible museums telling all the story of America in so many ways. So we prepared for it. 13th birthday, I wanted to do a father-son something with them, and, and so we planned. We got our hotel rooms, we got all our museum tickets, I contacted our senator's office because we want to go through the Capitol and be able to tour it, so grateful to our senator's office who got us uh, a tour and somebody that could lead us around and show us all these incredible things in the Capitol and all of our history, and we have an amazing history of the nation, by the way, if you just go there and you realize where we came from and all the God... God did to bring us together as a nation. is It's really incredible. And so we did all those things and got them all together. But one thing we could not get tickets to was the White House. And so I found out along the way, I thought I was advanced planning. 45 days in advance, I started like 
contacting, trying to research how do we get tickets to the White House and contacted everybody I could and I found out we could get on the list. We could actually go through the process, had to give our passport information, my social security number, my blood type. I mean, I had to give them everything to get on the list and they got me on the list to be able to uh, get tickets to get into the White House. The problem is at some point after I'd done all the process, sometime in advance, I got the email, the dreaded email. Thank you for applying to come visit the White House. Unfortunately, at this time, we don't have any openings for you, but maybe you can come back again another time and visit. I'm like, this is the only time we're coming to Washington, D.C. On this trip, we'd like to get in the White House. So I circled back to our center. I was like, do you have like, do you have any, is there any like, other ways to do this. Like, do you have like a backdoor tickets? Do you have something else you can do? And they said, let us call the White House, but we're not in control of that, but we'll call it. And grateful for them, they, they reached out to them, but we got another no. There was no other spaces to go. And so when we got to DC, we decided, well, maybe we can go talk to somebody, talk to the guards, get close. Maybe we're going to wait in line. What can we do? And I'm, I just want to show you how close we got to getting inside of the White House. This is a picture of how close we got. That's as close as we got on the outside, almost feeling like there's a bar separating us. We couldn't get in. We couldn't get access. We couldn't go see the president. Not that we were going to see the president. We couldn't go see his house. We couldn't walk in the garden. We couldn't do anything closer than this. Access wasn't granted to us. And I think what we take away from what Jesus did through his crucifixion as he tore that veil in two, as he was saying to humanity, it doesn't have to be that way any longer. God's presence is no longer restricted. Because of what I'm accomplishing on the cross, you too can be welcomed in to have a conversation with God. And I say, God, thank you for the good news of the gospel, that I'm not just on the outside looking in any longer like, would the heaven be great? Would God's house be great? Isn't it amazing if you could talk with the King of kings and the Lord of lords? No, as a believer in Jesus, I know that I'm accepted, that I belong, and that there's a place for me at the table too. And the reality is, if we bring the old picture into the new is this, the holy of holies is now available for all who Believe. How do we know that? It's because that used to be one room in one place that one person on one day for a short period of time could go into. But you know what happens when we come into a relation with God? The Spirit of God who inhabited that room, the Spirit of God now comes and inhabits us. The Holy of Holies isn't no longer in a building in a certain city and a certain location with certain entrance requirements, and now is inside of us, that I'm now the temple of the Holy Spirit, where God dwells of his own desire and opinion of choosing inside of me, imperfect as I am, impure as I am, unfit as I would be on my own, but now made fit because the blood of Jesus has forgiven me of everything past present, and future. And now the Spirit of God, hear me, church, the Spirit of God lives inside of you if you're a Christian. You are the holy of holies. He, destroyed, he tore that in two, and he's never going to rebuild that physical structure again, not of his own desire or will. I know people are waiting for that structure to be rebuilt. That is not God's intention or will for the end time, for him to rebuild another building. It would be to deny everything he's done to make it possible for the Spirit of God to live inside of us. His holy of holies is in part of us. And the Bible says when the body of believers come together, we're being built together Spiritual stones, it says, like person by person built together for the Spirit of God to inhabit us as the new structure that replaced the old, better, without restriction, so that we can come and be with him forever. Isn't that amazing? I just want you to recognize for a moment, if you're in Christ, and I don't know where everybody is spiritually today, but if you're in Christ, sometimes you feel his presence, sometimes you don't. Sometimes you feel really close to God, sometimes you don't. But I just want to make it clear to you, that holy of holies that was once a room is now inside of you. 
that's the kind of access you have to the God of the universe. Not only do you go visit a place, now that place goes with you wherever you are forever and ever. And what does that mean for us practically? It means you can come and you can pray. And I think we take that for granted. You can talk and hear from the God of the universe. You don't have to wait for that one time when you get just close enough. God, I don't wanna ask too much, but I just have one question and then you need to run off. All the time, anytime, wherever, whenever, you can pray and talk with God. You can ask him questions. You can listen to his voice. And frankly, you can linger in his presence without fear of what might happen. You can stay and remain. You can, get, you can go into your bedroom, turn the lights off, and spend time with God, and he's right there. You can go climb a mountain. You can go climb our mountain, Turkey Mountain, and you can meet with God, and you can hear from God. You can drive your car to work tomorrow, and you can speak and hear from the God of the universe. You can open his word and you can feel the presence of his spirit speaking through his word to your heart about your life, about what you should do and what you shouldn't do, what's sin, what's righteousness. You can hear from God because he's invited you in. He said, I know there was a disconnect, but now you can enter in freely at any time because of what I've accomplished on your behalf. Like Jesus saying, my blood, my pure blood, my offering before God has now covered all your sins. And I've purchased the ticket required for you to meet with God. I love what the writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. Thinking of all of these things and these places as the writer of Hebrews would in his day, he said, let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. You heard they didn't used to approach God's throne with confidence, actually with great fear and trembling, as they should have. But now we can approach God's throne with confidence, saying, I don't know if God's gonna accept me today. I don't know how God's gonna respond today. That's not what we do any longer. If you're in Christ, we approach with confidence, not frivolously, not pretending like it's not a big deal, not forgetting who God is, but approaching with confidence. You know what? I belong here. I'm welcome here. I have a ticket to this place. I can meet with him. I can talk with him. It's like this morning before I came to come and bring God's word for you today, I just went to the room in our bedroom that I bought recently. I was like, this is a place I'm gonna pray most, read the Bible most, and I just got down on my knees just for five, 10 minutes before I left the house, and I said, God, would you fill me with your Holy Spirit? Thank you that I get to talk with you. Thank you that I get to meet with you. Thank you that right here is the Holy of Holies, that there's no longer any separation, there's no longer any rejection, I'm no longer unfit to meet with you, I am fit to meet with you because of the blood of Jesus that covers over all my sin. Thank you, God, that you hear from me. Thank you, God, that you wanna hear from me. Thank you that you have things to say to me. And I was just spending a few moments, nothing complicated, no uh, big scripts. I wasn't preaching a sermon I got. I'm just meeting with the God of the universe and saying, God, thank you that I can meet with you on my knees today because they didn't used to be able to do what I can do because of your grace and your mercy. So God, I, st- I come here with confidence. I'm not cowering in fear. I'm not worried that I'm gonna get it wrong, say the wrong thing, and be rejected. I now know I belong to you. I'm your son, and you want to speak with me. So the writer of Hebrews said, all that has been done away with, and now, because of the blood of Jesus, if you need grace, where are you gonna go? You're gonna go with confidence to God's throne. You need some mercy. You ever need mercy in your life from God, a little forgiveness of sin? You need some mercy from God? Where are you gonna go? You're gonna go with confidence to the throne of grace. You need some help on something you're going through, a decision you're making or how to get through. You need God to do a miracle. You need God to heal your body. You need God to provide finances. You need God to come through in some area of your marriage or your relation with your kids or your friendships is broken apart. You need some help. Where are you gonna go? You're gonna go with confidence to the throne of grace. Why? Because God has taken that curtain and he ripped it in two 
so that you could come close to him. Which means what? I no longer have to stand at a distance and wonder if I'll be accepted. That's been determined. God wants to come, me to come to him because of the blood of Jesus and say, you know what? Because of what Jesus did for me, his crucifixion, his resurrection, which we're gonna celebrate over the next seven days together. We're gonna remember, he died on purpose to accomplish this kind of work on our behalf. And he rose again. He's not a dead God who did something but couldn't conquer the grave. He conquered the grave so that we could have a living, breathing, ongoing communication and relationship that's only gonna get better and better the closer we get to being with him in eternity forever. What a great, great gift of God to do what we could not do for ourselves. And so... As a close, what do we do with a message like this? I think there's two things that I have in mind that I think is the outcome of something like this. If you're in Christ Jesus and you realize the gravity of what God has done for us by opening a door that was closed, then that should spring forth in gratitude. I think one of the things we do as we encounter the truths of the Bible is not that we go do something, we have to go accomplish something because of it every time, Sometimes we do, but a lot of times what we do is just stand back. God, you're better than I thought. You're kinder than I imagined. It should just spring forth and worship. A lot of what we encounter in the Bible is then so we go do a bunch of things only on behalf of God, and I'm a big doer. It's just so we stop and we worship the God of the universe who made a way for you. And so if you're a believer in Jesus today, what's the proper response to this? I think it's joy gratitude, worship, thanksgiving to say, God, it could have been different than it is, but now because of what you did for me, I now can meet with you at any time, anywhere, any place. God, what kind of God are you? We didn't deserve it. What kind of God are you that you, even in the midst of humanity rebelling against you, would build an ark to save us? What kind of God are you that you would give your own blood to be on the doorposts of our hearts so you would pass over? What kind of God are you that when you saw unholy people decide to pay the price for the ticket for their access to meet with you? What kind of God are you to spring forth in gratitude and thanksgiving here today? And secondly, I think it's an invitation to not take lightly the opportunity to go and meet with him daily, ongoing, to talk with him. He paid the highest price so you could do it. And Jesus just wants to say, not just one time coming to me and to be saved, but an ongoing conversational relationship where you hear from him and he hears from you and you spend time together. It's just say, God, I'm grateful for what you did and I'm gonna take advantage of it. I think God wants you to take advantage of it. He wants you to fully utilize the access you have to meet with him and talk with him. And that's no small deal. If you're gonna write the story and you thought man would rebel against God, would you have written the story assuming that God would in his kindness die so that we could meet with him again? I don't think we would have, any of us would have written that story and thought that that was plausible and acceptable. And yet that's the story God wrote. So he says, Brad, I want you to pray. I want you to listen. I want you to read my word. I want you to meet with me. I paid the price so you could come in and be with me. So let's do it together. Let's be grateful. Let's pray. And let's seek God and say, the veil is torn so I can meet with you. So I will meet with you. Let's bow our heads and let's pray here together today. Jesus, what a great, unimaginable story that you would on that day make clear for humanity, for the priests that served in the temple, for the people that didn't even know about it at the time, but the the priests likely who came to faith and later told the story of the veil being torn. Lord God, thank you that that's your story. You were in the garden closing the door because you had a plan to reopen it in the right way at the right time so that we could be saved. The Bible says at just the right time you came to earth initiating your plan 
to bring humans closer to yourself. So Lord God, we're just grateful today. Lord God, I speak on behalf of all those who are in Christ, that are Christians here today. We're grateful that that's who you are, God. That you made a way for us to meet with you and talk with you. And so Lord God, we wanna be people who take advantage of the opportunity to come in and meet with you and to recognize that your spirit dwells with us and that we have the opportunity to talk with you. We're grateful today, Lord God. And Lord, I pray for all those that are here today that don't yet know what it's like to have the spirit of God living inside of them, that have never made a decision to become a a Jesus follower, to become a Christian, to believe in you and put their trust in you. Lord God, I pray that you'd spring up within them a desire to trust you and to obey you and to go all in with a relationship with you. But God, would you do that? Would you open hearts to you because you just love them more than they could even have asked or imagined. You love us more than we could ask or imagine. Lord, I pray that they would believe that here today. In fact, with every head bowed and eye closed, just a moment between you and God and you and me. I just wanna lead us through a prayer here today and maybe you're hearing you've never prayed a prayer become a follower of Jesus. I want you to pray this prayer with me today and give your heart to Jesus. Others of you, you're gonna pray this prayer and it's gonna be a prayer of rededication. You're gonna rededicate your life to Christ. You're gonna confess sin, repent of sin and receive forgiveness afresh here today and God's gonna do it. That's what God wants for you. He wants to open a door for you to have connection with him. And if you're not in Christ here today, then nothing I just said applies because it's the blood of Jesus that opens that door for every single person. And and how do we apply it? We just say, God, I don't understand everything, but I believe you died and you rose again. I believe you love me. I confess that I'm a sinner, that I need a savior, and I believe you're gonna forgive me. God takes those simple prayers and he changes our lives. So I wanna wanna lead us in prayer here today all across our church, our whole church family, including those making decisions and praying this for the first time. You can repeat after me. Heavenly Father, I come to you a sinner in need of a savior. I believe Jesus died for my sin and he rose again on the third day. So I'm choosing today to turn away from sin, to receive forgiveness and to follow you all the days of my life. Every head bowed just between you and God and you and me, so I can agree with you. If you just prayed that prayer for the first time in your life or first time in a long time, I just want you to boldly raise your hand in this room. Nobody's looking around, just me and you. I'm gonna agree with you as the Bible says. Does somebody agree with you? And we wanna pray for God to do a miracle. I see some hands popping up in this room. Others of you that say the same thing, as those who have raised their hands say, Pastor Brad, I just prayed the prayer for the first time in my life, first time in a long time, rededicating your life or beginning a relationship with Jesus here today. Lord God, we thank you for every heart and every hand, every life. We thank you for the boldness of those who prayed and raised their hand, just saying, God, here I am. I wanna know you, I wanna have a relationship with you. And Lord, I pray that you would do with them what you've done for so many of us and that you would just set them on the path of walking with with you that's gonna change their life forever in all the right ways. So Lord God, thank you for salvation, forgiveness, and a closeness with you. We pray for our friends that raise their hand today that you would bless their life and their future in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. And everybody said, can we put our hands together for those that raise their hand today? <clears throat> well, if you raise your hand and you're with somebody today, I'd love for you to tell them before you leave today and just say, hey, I raised my hand and explain what that meant for you and what that decision was. If you'd like to, we'd welcome you. We'd love to talk with you and meet you as well. If you made a decision, go by the next steps table in the lobby here today before you leave and just say, hey, I made, made a decision here today. Maybe you're becoming a Christian or rededicating their life to Jesus. Or maybe you wanna be baptized at our baptism that's coming up in a few weeks. We'd love to help you uh, with that here today. Last thing I wanna share today before we sing one last song together is next week is an incredible week around our church. Uh, We have Good Friday, as you know, and Easter. And I wanna say, what is the opportunity in front of us? The opportunity in front of us as God's people is to open the door for other people. So some of you are gonna serve on Easter. You're gonna open the door for other people to have an encounter with Jesus. 
Some of you are gonna invite people to come with you on Easter. You're gonna open the door for God to have an encounter with them. You're gonna do something. You're gonna say, God, I, I can't change everything, but I can open a door for people. I can extend an invitation. What I wanna encourage us to do is say, God, who are you sending me to this week to invite? You'd be amazed at how many people would just take your invitation and say, hey, are you going to church on Easter? No, I don't really go to church, or no, I don't know where to go, or yes, I'd like to go, but I don't know where to go. Well, why don't you come and sit with me at Anthem on Easter and just open the door and see what God might do? Because God might just change their future forever, and that's what we pray, right? And church, I wanna say, would you join with me? I'm gonna be praying all week that men, women, students, and kids will make decisions to become followers of Jesus on Easter. Would you pray with me? Would you pray that? Would you just pray that God would do the supernatural amongst us? Not just another day, not just go through the routine, but God would do the supernatural amongst us as we celebrate his name together. And by the way, last week of our series, Before the Doors of the Bible, ends on Easter with a bang, two of the most important doors of all. It's gonna be a great day together. Let's stand to our feet. Let's sing one last song together.